Um, my name is Bryce Wakefield. I'm with the Asia program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, which, as many of you know, is the official memorial to President Wilson. Uh, I'm um, an Asia program associate. Today's event is hosted by the Asia program. It's also hosted by um, or co-hosted by the Kissinger Institute for China and the United States. Our guest today is Bill Callahan. He's a professor, professor of international politics at the University of Manchester, and he's the co-director of the British Inter University China Centre. Uh, Bill is um, an author of a number of, uh, a number of publications on China, Cultural Governance and Resistance in Pacific Asia, and Contingent States, Greater China and Transnational Relations. Uh, he was a resident here at the Woodrow Wilson Center from 2007 to 2008, at which time he did much of the research for his book, China, The Pessoptimist Nation, um, which you can see there. And today he's going to be talking about, um, talking about that publication. And I think I'll let you take it from there. Could you please join me in welcoming Professor Callahan to the Wilson Center? Thank you, Bryce. Um, and I want to thank Bob Hathaway um, and the Asia Program and the Wilson Center for, I guess, first giving me a fellowship and then inviting me back to talk today. Um, I had a very uh, productive and fun time when I was here in 2007, 2008, so I recommend the, um, the residential fellowship to anyone. It's a, it's a very good program. Um, <clears throat> today, as Bryce said, I'm going to talk about my book, which is just published. Um, and it's actually, I think it's even more timely now than when I wrote it, if that makes sense. Um, because in the past six months or so, China has become much more assertive in its foreign policy, much more assertive in world affairs. Uh, we saw that in December at the Copenhagen conference, um, and we see it, uh, it's going to come up again in a week or two um, in talk about exchange rates between the yuan and the dollar. Um, but it's not just the yuan and the dollar, it's the euro and, and the yen and other currencies. So China is becoming more assertive all around the globe. <clears throat> Um, there's lots of ways to explain this. Um, China is in the midst of a transition. It's shifting from trying to fit into the international system to confidently, and some people say even arrogantly, asserting itself as the newest great power. So to understand China's new foreign policy agenda, um, especially as it takes a triumphalist attitude um, with what one of my colleagues calls a cranky nationalism, um, we need to take a new approach to China. So today I'll offer six modest proposals about how we can understand China and its foreign policy. Um, the first proposal <clears throat> is that we need to take culture and history seriously as part of China's national and international security politics. Um, while mainstream IR scholars see cultural issues as a distraction from the real politics of economic strength and military force, I think that the opening ceremony of Beijing's Summer Olympics can tell us much about um, the political direction of China's rise. Um, so I'll go to my first slide. At 8.08 p.m. on August 8, 2008, the world's gaze focused on Beijing for the Olympics opening ceremony. What it saw was the birth of a new superpower that emerged in a novel way through a stunning cultural performance as opposed to a decisive military victory. Um, China insists that it's rising in a new and a different way um, to be a status quo power rather than a revisionist state. Um, <clears throat> but there are other voices in China that are pushing in different directions that, that are increasingly challenging the international system. Um, my book tries to take culture seriously as a side of international politics by tracing the links between identity and security in China. So rather than uh, limit myself to examining the hard power of military and economic might, um, the book looks to a different set of questions, um, namely, who is China and how does it fit into the world? And what I'm doing here is trying to look at culture, but while avoiding being culturalist. Um, culturalism usually reproduces stereotypes of East versus West. Um, so 
by looking at culture in a critical way, um, I'm trying to get a more nuanced uh, appreciation of the variety of identity politics in China. Um, and that leads me to the second proposal, that we should extend analysis beyond official texts to see foreign affairs as an everyday activity among elites, academics, and the general public. Um, most analysts focus on Beijing's new multilateralism and China's peaceful rise. But since these themes are not deeply embedded in Chinese society, <clears throat> we also need to look beyond official policy to see how Chinese people relate to the world. Um, this is important because opinion makers in, in the PRC often go against Beijing's stated policy of peaceful multilateralism. We've seen that in recent books uh, like The China Dream, uh, and uh, which came out in January, and in a book that came out uh, a year ago this month, I think, um, Unhappy China. Um, but looking at these other sources, um, we can see how foreign, foreign affairs expands to encompass social activities where people divide friends from enemies, domestic from foreign, east from west, and patriots from traitors in everyday life, as well as in the halls of power. We thus need to widen the scope of our analysis to include unofficial texts in academic and popular culture. Um, it's still necessary to analyze official texts from China's foreign and defense ministries, but we also need to analyze Chinese films, television, novels, photos, blogs, online, and online videos um, to understand the interplay of state policy and, and popular opinion. And that's what I, I do in my book. This leads to the third proposal, is that there's a positive negative dynamic um, it, which defines Chinese foreign policy. Many people analyze China by looking at pairs of opposites like East and West, politics and economics, domestic and foreign, hard and soft power, elite and grassroots. They thus argue that one factor, like the elite, can help explain the other, the grassroots, uh, or that economic development guides the politics of foreign policy, for example. Yet when you look at Chinese discussions of what's going on in the PRC, you see that these contradictory elements are interwoven. The PRC's national security is closely tied to its nationalist insecurities. Um, domestic politics and foreign policy overlap. Soft and hard power produce each other, and elite and mass are intertwined. So to understand this complex dynamic, we should look at the creative tension between these opposites to see how one defines the other in a mix of positive and negative images. <clears throat> so on the one hand, according to a recent survey, China is the most optimistic country in the world. 86% um, th think that their country is going in the right direction. But on the other hand, China has one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Um, I thus argue that China is a pessimist nation. To understand China's growing uh, glowing, not growing, or glowing and growing, I guess, uh, glowing optimism, we need to understand its enduring pessimism and vice versa. Rather than being opposites, in China, pride and humiliation are interwoven, separated only by a fine line that can easily trade places. We saw this in 2008 with the Olympics. Um, Chinese people around the world were very proud and optimistic about the Beijing Olympics, but in the run-up to the Games, um, the run-up to the games also included um, very negative and pessimistic actions. In spring 2008, um, Chinese around the world held hyper-nationalist protests when people criticized Beijing for its policies in Tibet. My point is that China can shift very quickly from positive optimism um, to negative pessimism and back again. <clears throat> to understand Beijing's current triumphalism, it's necessary to appreciate China's politics of humiliation. This positive-negative dynamic is very common in China, both at elite levels and among the general public. So how can we understand these radical shifts between celebration and protests and between cooperation and confrontation? Um, my fourth proposal <clears throat> is that to understand Chinese nationalism and Chinese foreign policy, we need to understand pess optimism as <clears throat> what some people call a structure of feeling. It's a structure of feeling that sets the template for both domestic and international politics. Um, lots of people talk about emotional nationalism as a problem. In China, this is how they talk about it. Uh, emotional nationalism as a problem and rational nationalism as a solution, as if reason and emotion were separate and distinct. 
but I think structure of feeling is useful because it enables us to take emotions seriously and to account for how, for how people express them in social structures and networks. In this way, we can better understand how reason and emotion interact in official and popular culture. So I think that China has two interrelated structures of feeling. Um, the first is the outcome of a propaganda policy that was the response to the Tiananmen pro-democracy movement in 1989. After the June 4th crackdown, <clears throat> uh, China's leader Deng Xiaoping concluded that the democratic uprising was the result of a catastrophic failure in China's propaganda system. His solution was to more deliberately and rigorously teach China's youth and the general public about the proper way to be a patriotic Chinese. <clears throat> the result was a new patriotic education policy that has been implemented, implemented at all levels of education, as well as in the mass media, including museums, feature films, TV, and radio programs. Um, modern history became a major focus of China's patriotic education campaign. Um, but on the one hand, China's, Chinese textbooks aren't, aren't that strange. Um, like history textbooks in other countries, they seek to legitimize their modern state <clears throat> by linking it to the achievements of an ancient civilization. The prefaces of many modern history textbooks thus begin by describing the glories of 5,000 years of Chinese civilization. But patriotic education also includes a heavy dose of what is called national humiliation education, which commemorates China's defeats between the Opium War in 1840 and the, and the Communist Revolution in 1949. This century of national humiliation is a moral tale that knits together all of the negative events in China's pre-1949 or pre-revolutionary history that can be blamed on outsiders. Patriotic education thus looks to a combination of national pride and national humiliation to teach people that China is peaceful and civilized while foreigners are violent and barbaric. Um, it's not simply a history lesson, lesson. It tells them that the PRC still needs to defend itself against a hostile world. Um, as a Chinese general recently explained, quote, China once made outstanding contributions to world civilization, but in modern times it has been bullied by foreign powers and is is still, to some degree, being bullied, unquote. I guess to counteract the general, I thought I'd put a <laughs> mineral water. The, this, I guess I should explain a little. These are the ruins from the, um, the old summer palace, which was burnt down by Anglo-French Anglo forces in 1860. It's become an icon of national humiliation discourse and an example of how Chinese civilization was destroyed by barbaric foreigners. So this is the cover of a, uh, an atlas, and then this is the cover of a mineral water that you could buy uh, at, at this uh, old summer palace. Um, conversations with Chinese students confirm that national humiliation is now the common sense way of understanding China's modern history. It isn't just about the past. It sets the template for a contentious zero-sum understanding of international politics in the present and the future. This leads to my fifth proposal, that Chinese nationalism is more complex than state propaganda that the party elite uses to manipulate the people. China's pessimist structure of feeling has deep roots in pre-modern understandings of civilization and barbarism. Um, China's current patriotic education campaign is successful because it builds on a structure of feeling that precedes this particular propaganda policy and predates the PRC. In the book, I show how the national pride, national humiliation distinction grows out of a civilization barbarism distinction, which this is a, a civilization barbarism distinction um, is a key phrase that's been used for thousands of years in China and describes the governing ideology of uh, imperial China. Um, so here civilization is more than Confucian aphorisms and Ming vases. Um, civilization is better described, is better understood as a discourse that takes shape in relation to its opposite, namely barbarism. Whenever we declare something civilized, we're simultaneously declaring something else barbaric. Like in the West, civilization discourse here involves drawing important political and moral distinctions. 
between inside and outside, domestic and foreign, China and the West, and between pride and humiliation. Classical Chinese texts are full of passages um, that stress such distinctions. Um, quote, honor the king by expelling the barbarians, unquote, was a popular classical idiom. Um, at the turn of the 20th century, quote, expel the Tartar enemy, um, Tartar's Manchurian enemy, and restore China, unquote, was the revolutionary slogan of Sun Yat-sen's anti-Manchu nationalism. Um, a military banner in the Boxer Uprising in 1900 extended the classical notion of barbarian to include Europeans and Americans. It said, um, support the Qing, exterminate the Westerners. Now there's a, a popular phrase, never forget national humiliation, rejuvenate China. Um, this mix of entitlement and righteous rage is very strong in China because it draws on self-understandings that are both very ancient and very modern. Chinese identity emerges in an interactive process that appeals to both modern victimization and ancient civilization. <clears throat> Pass optimist nationalism is continually produced and consumed in a circular process that knits together urban elites and rural peasants, northerners and southerners, government officials and the new middle class into a singular national community. In this way, the party state gains legitimacy not only through economic prosperity, but also through a form of nationalism that unites these diverse groups as Chinese and often against the West. The stories of China's civilization and humiliation thus provide the template for China's foreign, relation, China's foreign relations that um, tends to prime the indignant youth for explosive protests that we've seen in the past few years. Um, which leads me to my sixth and final proposal. Um, the most important thing to understand about China's past optimism is that it is fundamentally unstable, producing shifting feelings. And kind of mixed feelings and shifting feelings is one of the um, things that I came across again and again when I was reading uh, Chinese texts about uh, Chinese identity. Um, it produces shifting feelings that at any time can spill over into mass movements to target domestic critics, foreigners, and even the party state itself. Um, well, it's necessary to treat China as a great power in the international community and encourage more moderate voices in Beijing. The most important thing to recognize is that no one um, can control pest optimist nationalism in China, not the party, the state, nor the intellectual elite. Um, in many ways, this situation comes from a disjuncture in China's view of itself. Uh, when China looks in, in the mirror, I mean, if, if a country could look in the mirror, um, the national image it sees is both too small, seeing itself as a poor developing country, and too large as the next superpower. <clears throat> Perceptions and capabilities are out of sync, which can warp both official policy and popular feelings. Um, while the global economic bubble inflated real estate and stock prices in China, the Chinese people have also experienced an inflated sense of self, especially with the success of the Olympics in 2008 and now China's uh, quick recovery from the global economic crisis in 2009. This propaganda bubble, which defines the 21st century as China's century, generates a strong sense of entitlement amongst officials, intellectuals, and public opinion. According to this popular view, China's rise is not the outcome of a fortuitous combination of state policy, hardworking Chinese, and the global market. Um, success is seen as China's right, quote unquote, while China's rise is taken as inevitable. This, this positive optimism <clears throat> also takes on negative forms. Um, anything that gets in the way of China's inevitable rise is seen as a, quote, obstacle, unquote, put there by foreigners whose nefarious schemes seek to, quote, deny the right of the Chinese renaissance, unquote. China's problems are thus are not seen as the result of the growing pains of a country undergoing rapid economic and social change, but as a result of a foreign conspiracies, <clears throat> which Beijing tells us, quote, hurt the feelings of the Chinese people. Um, this is a map that a, a graduate student in China made in December 2008 after French President Sarkozy, uh, or after, the, after Beijing canceled the EU-China summit because Sarkozy was going to see the Dalai Lama a week later. Um, the way that the People's Daily explained this kind of canceling of a major conference 
was that Sarkozy <clears throat> had hurt the feelings of the Chinese people. So what a, a enterprising graduate student did is he went to the People's Daily website search engine with the phrase, hurt the feelings of the Chinese people, and <clears throat> looked back over the past 50 years to all the countries that had hurt the feelings of the Chinese people, and then he made this map, because you can make maps very easily using web tools, and uh, posted it on the web. And it became a kind of a, a very curious thing, circulated and recirculated. So rather than having uh, maps of national humiliation that show territories that China has lost, this one is flipping it around to show um, kind of countries that have humiliated China. And you can see that there are, it's hard to explain, you know, why Australia hasn't, isn't on there. I guess they hadn't. New Zealand is New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually having to do with Taiwan and uh, the Dalai Lama and the hot button issues like that. Uh, but, you know, this, is, this sort of map gets kind of talked about uh, uh, extensively. <clears throat> um, complex <coughs> international incidents <coughs> thus are often read according to a grand zero-sum geopolitical logic that reduces the fertile complexity of Chinese identity to stereotypes of a virtuous East versus an immoral West. Um, there are many examples of Chinese officials and scholars concluding that a particular criticism of a specific event involving China entails a general Western conspiracy to hold China down. Another one for my map collection. Uh, this map, which is from uh, the cover of a hypernationalist book called China in the Shadow of Globalization, is a case in point. Um, this is from the back cover. They translated it did, uh, into Chinese for the front cover. Um, the authors insist that this is a common map in the West and thus evidence of a foreign conspiracy to divide China up into seven or eight different territories. But actually, the map is unknown in the West, and its source is not clear at all. I mean, uh, there are various stories for where this map came from, but the idea that it's uh, a popular map in the West is just not true at all. Um, and I think that this misunderstanding of this um, hypersensitivity stems from a broader problem that elites in China assume that as the PRC rises, it will necessarily enjoy, enjoy more friendship and respect. <laughs> While China expects that its growing soft power, and they love to use the phrase soft power, uh, will include greater control over how the world understands the PRC, um, the opposite is more likely to ensue. As the experience of the United States shows, um, the more power a country has, the more scrutiny it faces. Um, global power certainly can generate respect, but it also generates criticism simply because superpowers often become the focus of the international media, as they should. I think that's um, fine. Um, so while well, China is still certainly one of the top players <clears throat> in the global economics and politics, um, but its personalized notion of world politics, which is quick to take offense and demands a submissive style of respect, <clears throat> means that the early 20th century promises to be an interesting time, to use a Chinese idiom. Um, in a way, I think that the U.S. and Europe need to be more sober about China um, and that, uh, that we should avoid the caricatures of being pro or anti-China, of panda hugging or China bashing. And if we can avoid these kind of caricatures, we can focus clearly on the, what I think are the important issues, um, namely climate change, the global economy, human rights, and uh, nuclear non-proliferation. Um, Google's blog in January, uh, which, where they talked about, uh, where they challenged Chinese censorship and said they might have to withdraw from the uh, Chinese market, which they did uh, last week. Um, the original blog in January called The New Approach to China, I think, is actually quite fascinating, and I recommend that you read it, because in one page, it, it, it kind of changes the way we think about China in, in interesting ways. It takes the sort of sober view that I'm talking about, um, a sober view of the possibilities and problems that working with China um, presents. Um, so I think that we also need to have a new approach to how we talk about China and international politics, um, it's necessary to understand 
how Chinese elites use national humiliation and Chinese civilization as a template to frame international politics. And that's what I do in my book, is, is basically to look to, to sort of eavesdrop on conversations going on in China, especially in Beijing. But in the conclusion, um, and, well, throughout the book, but in, I, in the book I show how things like the century of national humiliation is not really a set of facts. Um, it's a structure of feeling that guides a certain form of politics. So while we encourage China to move beyond national humiliation discourse, it's also necessary for Western commentators to avoid using phrases like national humiliation, as many do, um, as if it's a historical fact that can help us explain China's actions. So it's not a fact. It needs to be explained. That's what I do in the book, basically, is shift it around. We need to understand national humiliation, therefore, not because it's true, um, but because understanding it is helpful for exiting this particular narrative of hostile international politics, which significantly narrows the possibilities for China and its relation to the world. So I'll just conclude by saying that the 2008 Olympics showed the world um, how happy and hospitable the Chinese people can be, and I'm sure we'll see this optimism and hospitality again with the Shanghai Expo, which opens in May and goes on all summer. Um, but since China also has a huge historical chip on its shoulder, we need to be prepared for a harsh popular reaction whenever China hits a bump on its rocky road of political and economic change. Um, so perhaps American uh, satirist uh, Stephen Colbert, for fans of the Colbert Report, um, Stephen Colbert said it best when he, when he described China as a frenemy. And at least that's how many Chinese see the rest of the world, and that's how they see themselves. All right. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> um, I think I'm going to take the first question. Uh, you touched on this briefly with, um, with your mention of the United States. And I know comparison is sometimes a bit of a dirty word when you're looking at, uh, at cultural politics and how culture influences international relations, but I'm wondering um, to what extent we're looking at a unique phenomenon um, in terms of Chinese culture here, or whether we're looking at something that is essentially applicable to all rising powers. Um, I ask this because my, in my own work, I, I primarily work on Japan, and um, a lot of the uh, facets, I guess, of uh, of of, of the interaction between popular culture and policy um, that you've just described happened in Japan um, in the period between, say, 1985 and 1995. Uh, we had very sensitive, uh, one might argue, Japanese policymakers. We had accusations of Japan, Japan bashing um, from the Japanese side. Now, I would argue that there was a lot of Japan bashing going on, but there were also some very nuanced, very um, very thoughtful criticisms of Japanese policy coming out of the United States, which were then interpreted as um, as overcritical of Japan. So I just wonder whether um, whether we're looking at a Chinese phenomenon here or whether it's uh, something a little bit more universal. Uh, thank you for an interesting question. Um, I think that, yeah, talking about China now um, does give you a sense of deja vu to the late 1980s, talking about Japan. But I guess I would echo your point that we can't just dismiss criticism of China as China bashing the way most criticisms of Japan were dismissed at that time, because there's actually a lot going on in China that we need to have a more nuanced and critical and kind of an academic sense understanding of. Um, <clears throat> what's going on in China is not unique, and I, I try to get away from that culturalist way of understanding things like, ooh, this is Chinese culture, and ooh, we can't really understand it as foreigners. Um, China is, is a very modern country and is dealing with the same problems that other countries deal with. Um, but it's dealing with them in particular ways, highlighting um, history, geography, and culture in specific ways towards its domestic audience um, that often don't filter out into um, international discussions. 
So there's, as I said in my paper, and I talk about a lot in the book, um, there's a lot of talk of national humiliation and cleansing national humiliation. Now this phrase, gotcha, um, you find it in Korea and in, I think in Japan too. Um, and you find it in, if you search through the uh, FBIS files and various things, um, you can see it in other places like Iran and Syria and Russia. So it's kind of countries that f are either declining or from greatness or rising after kind of a, um, problems before. So it's countries in transition from one thing to another often mixes pride and humiliation. Um, but it's not a universal thing, I don't think. Um, and it it's particularly strong in China because it's been institutionalized through education and propaganda and um, media. I mean, I, I kind of hesitate to say propaganda because it sounds like I'm a cold warrior or something, but we have to recognize that the propaganda, the central propaganda department in China is quite active and quite successful, and they are really guiding discourse in uh, very important ways, not just in China, but now outside China through media outlets and Confucius Institutes and things. Um, and it's all part of a very integrated policy. I think I started to ask, answer your oh, question. Good. Okay, uh, Doug. Hi, uh, Doug Spellman at the Kissinger Institute. Uh, I congratulate you on what I think is uh, very much a factor of, or a facet of what's happening in China today. But uh, a little bit like Bryce's perspective, um, in Taiwan, uh, commentators have mentioned, and I've sensed some, as... Um, as Taiwan has moved up the development uh, scale, uh, these references to uh, China's century of humiliation seem to have fallen away somewhat. Um, so I wonder if you could comment on, on the future. Do you think that uh, as China strengthens and becomes more confident because of that strength, that this repetition of the century of humiliation and uh, the impact that it's had on their structure of feeling, if you will, uh, might um, uh, abate somewhat? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> the, I mean, the argument that you're giving is one that is um, popular amongst people who talk about China's confident foreign policy and how China's become more multilateral. But when I look at, at the... Um, evidence of just the number of times phrases are mentioned in the press or how many articles are published about national humiliation education or how often it comes up in official speeches, I found that the um, that national humiliation discourse is not going away and that even when people like Jiang Zemin said in 2001, uh, July 1st, 2001, uh, for the 80th anniversary of the CCP, he said, oh, we have finally cleansed national humiliation. Well, what is interesting is that two months before that, they had passed a law saying that China needed to have a National Humiliation Day. And then two months after it, they celebrated their first National Humiliation Day. And the same sort of thing that Hong Kong was supposed to cleanse national, hum the return of Hong Kong in 1997 was supposed to cleanse national humiliation forever. Um, and that, again, the handover was uh, July 1st, 1997. But then um, on July 7th, they celebrated another National Humiliation Day, which was the Japanese invasion of China proper in 1937. And then they celebrated on a grand scale the uh, Nanjing Massacre on December 7th, um, 1997. So as people say, oh, we're over it, Often the same people say, you know, a couple months or a couple weeks later, repeat the same thing. So this is why I think pass optimism is a a good way to talk about it, even though it's uh, hard to hard to pronounce sometimes. Um, <clears throat> the the point of pass optimism is it's not a factionalized view like liberals versus conservatives in the U.S. Um, 
what I'm analyzing is how often the same people, the people in the same same groups, are optimistic one moment and pessimistic another moment. I'm talking about national humiliation one moment and then cleansing it and you know the next day and then national humiliation again two days later. Um, so that's why I, I use these strange phrases is try and capture some of the complexity of what's going on in China. Um, Taiwan, they actually they talk about sadness now, Beijing, um, in, which is very similar. It's used in very similar ways to national humiliation in China, the sadness of being Taiwanese, and you know how in the same way that it's hard to overcome humiliation, it's hard to overcome sadness. Um, but again, anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you. I'm Norm Hastings. <clears throat> I'm wondering, uh, among the um, propagandists and the ideologues in the government and in the party, is there any effort to retain a communist framework or a Marxist framework in this new uh, intellectual structure, or perhaps alternately, has you know, throwing out that framework to a large part in other areas liberated uh, the thinkers of uh, and and and, and uh, you know artists of this uh, to uh, to go a different direction. What's going on in China now is that they're trying to combine all sorts of um, often contradictory things. So so while a lot of people say there's been a grand shift from socialism as China's ideology to nationalism. Um, I think that what's going on now shows how both are being promoted, um, often at the same time. Um, that to be patriotic is to be socialist, to be socialist is to be patriotic. Um, certainly there's been a hollowing out of ideology, so socialism doesn't mean the same thing now as it meant 20 years ago. But it comes out in some of the phrases that <clears throat> the uh, leaders and the propagandists use. So one of them is about um, China's domestic politics. It's called harmonious society. And that, ooh, that sounds traditionally China, um, Confucian, something. But actually, when the, it's only called harmonious society in English. In Chinese, it's called harmonious socialist society. So they mix both uh, socialism and um, nationalism. And one of the arguments now is that uh, Chinese tradition and socialism have a lot in common, so there actually isn't a contradiction between them. Um, they seem to have class conflict. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, so that's what I'm saying, that, that socialism isn't about class struggle anymore. Um, the CCP, since, uh, well, since that speech in 2001, has not seen itself or defined itself as a revolutionary power, now it's seen, or revolutionary party, and now defines itself as a ruling party. Um, but, yeah, you can see how all sorts of things are going on in China that you need to uh, look very closely at to try and understand. Bob, did you have a question? I'm um, Bob Hathaway here at the Wilson Center. Bill, welcome back. It's uh, good to have you back. It's uh, Good to get uh, another take on your project that you were working on when you were here. Um, my question is not all that dissimilar from Doug's, and I think I know the answer, but I'd like for you to tell me anyway. Mm -hmm. Are you talking um, about a mindset and a worldview that is characteristic only of people living in a nation-state called China? Um, do Chinese who don't live in China proper share uh, the same worldview or approach or philosophical bent? Um, if they do, do they share it to the same extent that native Chinese do? Um, is it a factor of how long they've been away from China? Um, how, how does this sort of play out beyond the boundaries of China itself? That's a very good question. Um, People who talk about uh, Chinese identity only in terms of propaganda and kind of state manipulated manipulation of education can't really explain why um, 
overseas Chinese and Chinese students abroad who are sort of outside the grasp of the um, uh, the party state, why they often say things, often use phrases like national humiliation and talk about the West bullying China. We saw that in um, March 2008, that there were protests among amongst Chinese students and overseas Chinese around the world that you couldn't trace so closely to what the Chinese government was telling its, its people. Um, that's why I think we also have to look at kind of um, deeper roots for this way of understanding um, how identity works um, amongst Chinese around the world. And that's why I think <clears throat> we need to look at things like civilization and barbarism as a, uh, another structure of feeling. Um, and it, um, when, you, when you look at them together, um, I think you can see that this is one way that Chinese people around the world think about what it is to be Chinese. Um, that it's not just a positive thing about 5,000 years of civilization and great uh, literature and art, but it's also that China has been oppressed, or the Chinese people have been oppressed for the past 150 years, and that now they're overcoming this uh, problem um, to, you know, to rise, China's rise. Um, so that the kind of narrative that's put out um, by Beijing um, affects not just people in China, but it also presents certain ways of being Chinese around the world. And we saw that with Iris Chang's book, uh, The Rape of Nan Nanking, which is about the Nanjing Massacre. Um, it was very curious that the, most of the activists about the Nanjing Massacre are Chinese Americans and Chinese Canadians um, who have uh, decided that this is one way of expressing their identity. And they go to China and they um, get a lot of cooperation from people in Nanjing at the Massacre Memorial. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is that this is one of the options about how to be Chinese outside, uh, outside China as well as inside China. It's not the only way to be Chinese or to be a Chinese American, but it's one that, that often surfaces, um, especially when there are problems. Does that make sense? I'm uh, Bernard Gordon. Uh, could, you, could you wait till the uh, microphone comes over? <coughs> uh, Bernard Gordon, University of New Hampshire. I'm tempted to deal with the map because, uh, of course, I was as curious, I suppose, as Bryce was, seeing that New Zealand was in deep black and Australia was not. But I, I mean, some of those are quite accurate. I mean, Vietnam, of course, would be a bad guy. But I, I don't want to focus on that. I want to. Uh, it's a fun map. It really is. It's intriguing. Um, my, my, my real question is this. Uh, I've been working for some time on issues of uh, regionalism in Southeast Asia, uh, and that's where my, my, my work has been. There has been um, a, double, uh, a double side to that. At one point, uh, some of the Chinese media stressed the utility of the Nanyang Chinese. Uh, and but now uh, that is not being emphasized. And uh, so I wonder if you could put this into contemporary foreign policy terms, how do you see, because uh, this uh, development of China's uh, economic relationship with the ASEAN group and so on is so, um, so strong, so evident, how do you see uh, what you have been working on as, as it is manifested, reflected in this uh, China rise relationship in Southeast Asia. I'm not quite. I'll try and answer your question. If I don't understand it, then maybe you can correct me. Um, let me let me back up. Ma a major emphasis in China's ASEAN connection. Yeah. Very, very sophisticated, very calm, very quiet. <laughs> but uh, a decade ago, there was occasional direct reference to the asset that the indigenous Chinese population represented. So what I'm asking, I, I hope I can. Yeah, I mean, in 
in, in um, Chinese language discourse, uh, there's still a focus on overseas Chinese. So they um, commonly, the, the policy journals um, commonly talk about how, well, the ASEAN uh, economic success is basically all Chinese people. Uh, that um, Thailand is run by Chinese, ethnic Chinese people, and that sort of thing. Um, part of their sophistication is to not say this when they're at an ASEAN meeting and not say it in English or another, another uh, kind of ASEAN language. Um, but I still see the focus on overseas Chinese as bridges or as connections um, as very strong in China's foreign policy. I mean, a lot of the economic development that happened in the 1980s in China came from investments from overseas Chinese tycoons from Southeast Asia. And they, you know, they remember that and they're happy and grateful for it. And that's one of a very strong connection between China and uh, certain Southeast Asian countries. Um, I think what's going on now is there was a there was a transition that you've talked about maybe five years ago to treat um, Thailand as being composed of Thai people rather than some ethnic Chinese and ethnic Thais, um, and the same in in Malaysia and other and Indonesia, but. I think what's going on now is that China is becoming more confident in the sense that it doesn't feel it has to do that anymore, that it can um, treat Southeast Asian countries as if they are tributary states, as they did uh, 150 years ago. And you again, you hear this in uh, some Chinese language books and articles. Um, and China has concessions, ter has territorial concessions in places like Laos and Cambodia where you use Chinese currency and Chinese law applies. And this is interesting to me because this is one of the main complaints, this is one of the main national humiliations is that cities like Shanghai in uh, pre-revolutionary China uh, were concessions where British and French law uh, ruled, and you use British and French and whatever currency. Um, so it's very interesting how Chinese policy and practice is changing really quickly um, and in ways that are just very curious because they're reproducing some of the things that they criticize. So it's kind of Things they criticize, not just not nonchalantly, but um, that are part of their whole national identity. Um, so again, that's why I say it's going to be an interesting century. Uh, Dorian Perez, uh, we know that Chinese netizens can be both patriotic as well as uh, critics of the government. And the, uh, as you said, the government has officially sanctioned National humili Humiliation Days throughout the calendar year. Could you shed light on the convergence between genuine grassroots um, humiliation, government-sanctioned humiliation, and the, the two photos you showed of the deck of cards and the mineral water bottle? Is that also government or is that entrepreneurship taking advantage, trying to capture that? Um, to make money. Uh, thanks, Dorian. Dorian was one of my students at University of Manchester last year in uh, an MA class. Um, it was good to see him here. Um, I guess what what you're talking about is not how, it's not just how the government produces these images, uh, but how people are consuming them now, and that how identity in China and in other countries too, but I studied China, so I'll talk about it, um, has become a commodity um, that people buy and sell. Um, so that these uh, playing cards on the left show, uh, it's a uh, 18th century, it's from an 18th century painting 
the 40 vistas of the uh, old summer palace. And then on the right is the ruins to remind you know, civilization on the left, barbarism on the right. Um, and they put barbarism as a joker, so I just couldn't resist putting that on my book cover. Um, and when I, when I saw this, I uh, thought, wow, this is very interesting that it's gone beyond just government uh, propaganda that people, entrepreneurs, are saying this is a saleable idea or a saleable commodity that people uh, in China will buy. And the same as we saw with the, uh, with the mineral water. Um, that's one of my favorite uh, images, I have to say. It's just, um, to me, it's just a very uh, contradictory. Um, so yeah, I guess my point is, is that uh, to understand identity and nationalism in China, we have to look at how it's produced and consumed by various groups. In the corner there. Uh, Yuki Yoshikawa at the uh, Russia Center. Uh, I have a question. When you are talking about national humiliation, um, what kind of uh, aspect you, uh, the Chinese literature has been focusing on? Like in the humiliation, that can be both like the outside country is teasing China and also like China is too weak to not to be teased. And um, when the Chinese talk about the humiliation, does it mean like um, to to get closer among the Chinese because the uh, outsider is too mean to China? Or like um, when the, they are rising, they are acknowledging it and say like, well, a century years, a century ago, it was uh, very weak, but it has been like coming overcoming. So. Uh, at this point, so uh, w how is it using that humiliation? <clears throat> I mean, you bring up a very important point that uh, humiliation or shame is um, in Chinese as well as in English, it can be both a positive or a negative thing, that having shame is, is good. You don't want to be shameless. Um, um, but shame also is something, humiliation is also something that people do to you. And in China in the early 20th century, they also had National Humiliation Days and National Humiliation Maps. And there was a lot of discussion on the editorial pages of Chinese newspapers about, oh, uh, Japan and the West have humiliated China, but we should be ashamed too, that we need to... Um, unite, we need to be strong, we need to have a strong military, strong um, state. So it's both criticism of the outside, the imperialists, but also a self-criticism of how China wasn't, you know, strong enough. Um, when National Humiliation Discourse uh, revi was revived in 1990, because there was a 50-year hiatus where Nobody talked about national humiliation in China. Between about 1940 and 1990, um, it was just not a, a popular topic, I mean, not a common topic. When it, when it reappeared in 1990, the focus was only on criticizing outsiders for humiliating China in the past, and there's been very little of the self-reflective uh, sense of shame about, well, why you know, what, what's wrong with us? Why are they doing this to us again and again? Um, China is also in a very different situation now than it was at the, at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, beginning of the 20th century, China was divided, it was weak. Um, now China is quite united and quite strong. So that's why it's, um, I think, even more important to understand why uh, certain groups in China keep reviving this this discourse it keeps being reproduced again and again um, I mean there's every year there's a call to uh, have an even more official National Humiliation Day on September 18th to uh, commemorate Japan's invasion of uh, Manchuria in 1931 so and this is done by edit editorial op-ed writers it's done by people in the National People's Congress and by academics, it's just, there seems to be a lot of 
uh, demand or interest in seeing um, both domestic politic, domestic identity, and international politics through this very narrow kind of framework? I wonder then, I mean, do you see, I'm not quite um, clear on where you see this discourse coming from. I mean, the, the mainstream critic of international relations would say, well, this is all just a, uh, this is all just a ploy by the government. Um, it's the government that is, that is producing this culture in order to unite the nation, and maybe, okay, it sticks around and has its, has its own sort of independent effects after that. I mean, do you see this as, as a naturally occurring phenomenon that has accompanied a sort of transitional fa phase in Chinese history, or do you see it as um, something that is produced by elites that have a specific goal in mind? Um, initially, it was very much uh, an elite propaganda policy. Um, I am pretty confident that it was seen as a short-term tactic to deal with, uh, you know, how to get loyalty and legitimacy after the Tiananmen Massacre in 1989. But what has happened is that... Um, It's become a long-term strategy for managing identity uh, and nationalism in China. And it's actually grown beyond what the state can or cannot do. That's why I say it's out of anyone's control. Because it, um, speaking about identity and international politics in this way, um, just struck a chord. Uh, amongst, you know, certain sectors of the Chinese populace anyway. And it has its own momentum now. So rather than seeing it as an unnatural um, propaganda policy that's foisted upon the people or as a naturally occurring grassroots feeling, I think we need to get rid of those kind of categories because that's the way people understand Chinese nationalism now. It's either top-down or bottom-up. What I try to do in the book is argue that it's, it's both top down and bottom up and that we can't, can't distinguish so clearly anymore between them and that um, because it's not just top down we have to take it more seriously than some government policy that can, can change. I mean we'll see what happens if the um, if Beijing decides to stop using these themes in textbooks and stop talking about Japan in this way and stop talking about the U.S. and Taiwan using these sets of concepts to see what happens, to see if um, this hyper-nationalism somehow evaporates. But I, I don't think so. I think it's just gone beyond that. Mm -hmm. Do you... Um do you see that as potentially troubling for um, the Chinese regime? I mean, I have heard accounts of Chinese nationalism that it has become institutionalized now, and um, the government itself is, sees it as a problem rather than, rather than something they can take advantage of. They do, but again, I guess I don't subscribe to that way of framing the question about, oh, they did it and now it's out of control. So I don't think that talking about Chinese politics in terms of control or lack of control mm -hmm. can tell us that much because uh, colleagues of mine who do this say that, oh, well, the solution is for the Chinese government to have even more control over textbooks and to change them so that they can have good propaganda rather than bad propaganda. Um, so even the, the liberals in China still kind of subscribe to this propaganda state way of um, understanding uh, Chinese identity. <clears throat> I see it, I guess, in a different way that, as I said before, it was something that, they, that the Chinese leadership probably came up with by writing on the back of an envelope as a short-term tactic to deal with what they saw as a huge challenge to their uh, to the, the Communist Party's survival in 1989-90. Um, 
And as I said, it's sort of taken on a life of its own, and now it's blowback um, that they they still like it, but they don't like it all the time. Um, you can see these. I mean, these are important questions that are hard to yeah. hard to answer. I'm kind of startled, frankly, at um, referred to as a 50-year hiatus. I mean. <laughs> The, the scholarship with which I was brought up, I was trained at the University of Chicago, and um, what you refer, well, let me, you know, remind myself. In 49, Mao Zedong said China has stood up. Um, I've always taken he that. He also said we will never be humiliated again okay. before he said that. You know, and um, the, in my understanding of these things, and this is not my special field, so I really want to hear what you have to say on it. In my understanding of these things, the, the period of national humiliation is real. It was genuine. It was all of those things of extraterritoriality and the concessions and all the things that were done in the late 19th century from the 1840s and 50s on. Um, the <laughs> my, uh, my understanding of this, that this was a real, genuine, period of humiliation. I re appreciate what you said a moment ago that the Chinese at some ways look inward and say, what, how did we allow this to happen? I understand that. But are you saying that this is, I, I think you're maybe treading close to it, are you saying this is a matter of something that has been fabricated or continued or made more real than it has been? And let me just say one last thing. I've lived in Japan a bunch of years, and I know <laughs> how strongly and devoutly and steadfastly the Japanese do not want to be reminded of these things, and they deny them and all that. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit more about the, the, uh, the humiliation thing. Um, well, that's why I said that um, the, quote, century of national humiliation, unquote, is not a set of facts. It's an interpretation of China's modern history. It's the main interpretation of China's modern history. Um, there are other ways of interpreting it. Um, and Mao actually interpreted Chinese history in different ways. Starting in 1950, um, you didn't see a lot of these phrases. Uh, like national humiliation and that that whole set of uh, idioms, because um, Mao was talking about um, more active, positive in the sense of productive things like class struggle and world revolution. He was not really interested in talking about um, bad things that had happened before. He was more interested in changing China and looking to the future rather than looking to the past. And if you look at the way, um, you look at his speeches and look at textbooks, they occasionally mention um, lost territories. So there's one page in a lot of history textbooks that lists lost territories. But it's really a submerged theme um, after about 1935. I mean, the nas there was an official National Humiliation Day in Republican China between 19, well, unofficially 1915, became official in 1927. It was canceled in 1940 because it said, oh my God, Japan has launched an all-out invasion and we have to think beyond this narrow scope of understanding our, our country and modern history in terms of national humiliation, that we have to think of it in terms of this broad-based resistance to Japan. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do, is to kind of unpack how um, things like humiliation and civilization aren't sort of natural, genuine things, but that they're discourses that some people use at certain times. and but then again, they don't use it other times. So this hiatus, this 50-year hiatus, is the main reason why I wrote the book. So I wanted to explain, oh my god, they talked about it in the early 20th century, and then they didn't. And then they started talking about it again in 1990. Um, it must be, in, it, it, it's also interesting because uh, there are no Chinese 
articles or books that talk about the hiatus either. There are people who talk about, and there are very few who talk about the discourse at all because it's taken for granted as common sense now. It's it's fascinating how something shifts from being this antiquarian curiosity to being common sense over the period of about 10 years between 1990 and 2000. Have I answered your question? Okay. A gentleman down the back there. Jim, da Jim Danridge, Association for Diplomatic Studies and Training. Uh, I was um, interested in your mentioning the control of the textbooks as a part of the, um, the, the phenomena of the, um, of the national propaganda. In, in some travels in China some years back, uh, one of the things that struck me was that um, the Voice of America broadcasts, for instance, which were effectively jammed and uh, cut off as far as internet broadcasting is concerned. And nevertheless, uh, going to the English speaking section of the uh, bookstores, mm -hmm. there were all of the text of the jam broadcast <laughs> with accompanying CDs in the interest of furthering um, teaching English both uh, in, in public um, 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 uh, institution as well as use in the secondary school system, uh, which brought to mind a certain line of pragmatism as far as uh, how far the central government would go in permitting or not permitting certain um, uh, materials to be um, distributed, uh, be available to the public. Um, could you um, talk to that a, a bit as to yeah well the that's, land that's a great example um, of how um, the, the sort of things that I'm talking about, um, the nationalist education and images and media, I think um, are promoted to counteract or balance the sort of things that you're talking about, learning English not just through Voice of America or B the BBC, but that once you learn English, then you can read you know, lots of things on the web. So th that's part of the dynamic that, the policy dynamic, I would say, in Beijing is kind of trying to balance this um, reform and opening policy that has allowed China to have you know, very successful economic growth, um, to balance that with other sources of legitimacy that are more focused um, inwardly on China and uh, uh, a more kind of radical distinction between inside China and outside China. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Jun Shimi, Japanese Embassy. Mm -hmm. And I was very, you know, impressed and enlightened um, by your explanation, especially, you know, kind of the identity dilemma which China is now facing with. And my question is that, um, you know, some people said, well, you know, the problem of the China is because of that political regime, you know, totalitarian or communism, something like that. But uh, do you think that hypothetically, if in the future, China come to be uh, democratized. Uh, do you say that that you know identity dilemma you mentioned to be resolved peacefully, or you know that dilemma could be further accumulated because of the freedom and the democracy? Then China could become more unstable, young democratic you know countries. Thank you. That's an, another very good question. Um, most most countries as they democratize or become more democratic, also become more unstable. Um, and it depends on what you mean by uh, democratization. If you just mean um, elections, then I think that that would lead to even m kind of more of a nationalist China, because it's a good vote-getter. In the same way that you can sell playing cards, you could <clears throat> convince people to vote for you. Uh, but if you include... Um, I ideas of civil society in a more open media where there's more open debate, then I'm actually more optimistic 
about um, the possibilities for um, not just democracy in China, but how that would affect um, the region and the rest of the world. Because um, there seem to be people in China uh, pushing at the bounds um, of censorship. Um, I was just at a conference, the Association for Asian Studies conference in Philadelphia, and um, the Chinese government actually didn't let a poet come and talk at the conference. They, they f forbade her, which was very interesting because she is known, uh, her name is Sui Renping, her, she's known not for being a radical, for being, but for being mostly an establishment intellectual. Um, but she was among the people who were pushing at the boundaries of China because she signed the uh, Charter 08. Um, uh, ch she signed Charter 08 in December 2008 along with uh, Liu Xiaobo, um, which calls for a more democratic uh, China. And this was seen, and we were talking about this at the conference, and um, people were saying that that's probably the best example for why she was not allowed to come to the conference and not allowed to go abroad. That This was seen as her uh, punishment for signing that. Um, and to be frank, it's not much of a punishment. You know, going to the AAS is not that big a deal. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, you can, you can understand these things. I like, oh my God, they aren't allowing her to come, or oh, well, you know, it's not that much of a punishment. Um, so I think that people are pushing at the boundaries, um, and if they start loosening up, uh, you'll have just a mix. You'll have a lot more hyper-nationalist media, but that's already there because it's already tolerated. But I think you would get some more um, progressive or liberal um, voices coming out too. Gentleman up the back. Good afternoon, Shannon Barnes. Thanks, Professor Callanan, for your comments. I really uh, was interested in it. I particularly liked um, the idea of the pessoptimism and the comment that you talked about about looking in the mirror and seeing the developing country versus the next coming superpower and how there's that confused sort of identity problem. And I, I think that, that f feeds directly into how we see the leadership op operating on a on a day-to-day, week-to-week sort of basis, that uncertainty of where they are in the world. My question sort of follows on from the gentleman just before in terms of the century of shame and um, how much of a constructed idea it is versus the, the real events versus what it's been portrayed as in the, in the propaganda and whatnot. And I wanted to ask a little bit more about the strategies you see for Western governments in dealing with the Chinese um, on this issue because it obviously... Um, the century of shame and this idea of them being a developing nation feeds into the way that they operate in on dialogue such as um, human human rights, um, global warming sort of stuff, climate change, that sort of thing, that they have, um, they're in a unique position that they shouldn't be operating on the same rules as developed nations, that they should be given some leeway in their ability to operate as a nation state. Um, what strategies do we have of meeting that? You sort of talked about the idea of removing the centre of humiliation from the dialogue that Westerners use in talking about China. But what other suggestions do you have? And is that also the best means of sort of approaching it with a, a reconciliation kind of approach? Um, I guess my idea of a strategy for uh, the U.S. government and other Western governments is quite simple, is to treat China like it's a normal country. Don't give it special privileges or don't um, treat it any better or worse than any other country. Because that's often what uh, my Chinese colleagues say. They want to have China be a normal country. Um, What's going on in the past six months is that China has shifted from being sort of an underdog to being a, uh, seeing itself as a top dog. And it's bypassed the whole notion of being equal with the U.S. or equal with the European Union. Um, so that's what I would stress, is to, tr to treat China more soberly um, and um, carefully. 
but don't let China manipulate you either. Uh, I think that, um, like, that, yeah, I guess I'll just stop there. Just treat China like a normal country um, and expect China to complain about things, but don't, don't always uh, um, kind of change your policy uh, based on what you think are unreasonable complaints. Um, I guess I'll say something more controversial that I think it's fine for uh, President Obama to meet the Dalai Lama. Um, I think that is uh, our sovereign right to meet with whoever we want and that it's quite outrageous for China to try and tell another country who its president or prime minister can or cannot meet. Um, uh, they can complain about it, but to say that it's some sort of uh, diplomatic problem that needs the U.S. to um, think about its mistakes and correct them in the proper way, as, as Beijing has said, I think that that's uh, going too far, that Beijing has gone too far on things like that. Controversial enough? <laughs> Great. Um, if we have no more questions, then uh, I'd like to call things to a close. Um, if you'd like to join me, ah, before before joining me in thanking uh, Professor Callahan, um, I'd like to note that we do have flyers for his book. Unfortunately, we couldn't arrange a book. Um, uh, we couldn't arrange to sell some books here at the centre. Um, however, we do have some flyers, so I'd encourage you to take some. Available, I think, from fine good fine bookstores everywhere and Amazon.com. So. Mm -hmm. Um, could you please uh, join me in thanking Professor Callahan for his wonderful talk. <laughs>